Okay, part five, chapter 13, states of matter. A lot of concepts here, a lot of ideas. Um, make sure you elaborate on these answers and it'll be easier for you to remember the stuff on the test. Again, if I'm going too fast, hit the pause button. I expect that you should be hitting the pause button almost every single problem so you could read uh, after I'm done talking or even before I'm, I start talking, read what's in blue and then go ahead and listen. All right, three major components of the kinetic theory. The first thing we have to assume is that they're the gas particles are small hard spheres that they're constantly moving they just don't say I'm tired I'm going to sit down for a little while here and not move they're all constantly moving and they make elastic collisions remember if we drop a little uh, a regular basketball it'll hit the ground and then it'll bounce back up but not as high because it's some of the energy got dissipated into the ground and then it goes down again not as high and so forth it keeps losing energy into the ground when gas particles collide they never lose their energy Remember we talked about in class, think flubber. Okay, just kind of bouncing around nonstop without uh, losing energy. Number 32, explain what air pressure is and what three values. Air pressure is the force of all the air particles colliding, and we measure it using a variety of different units. We could measure in ATMs, it's one. We can measure it in kilopascals, 101.3, think the radio station. And we can measure it in millimeters of mercury, or we also call that TOR. Um, which is 760 millimeters. We also exposed you guys to 14.7 psi. We live in America here, um, who's m more commonly using this, these English units than the metric at times, so you might come across psi's on things. Um, so it's 14.7 psi. It's standard atmospheric pressure. Now, how does a barometer work, and then how high would you expect mercury to rise? If you have a barometer, it's basically not the safest thing to have in a school. It's a bowl of filled with mercury, and then you have the inverted test tube. Now the air pressure pushes down, the outside air pressure pushes down on the mercury. The mercury says, well, there's a lot of force pushing on me. Where am I gonna go? I'm gonna go up into the test tube. I'm gonna go up into here where there's less pressure. And it rises to a certain point, and we can measure how high it goes because this inverted test tube has calibration marks on it. So we can see if it's going up to so many inches. If so, if you watch a weather forecast, you might see it around 29 inches. Um, in real science, we're going to use the metric system. So we talk about millimeters, and it's 760 millimeters of mercury. That's how high it normally goes at sea level. But if you were to take this thing around and to different locations where there's different air pressures, then it's going to go up even higher or not as high. So let's think about what this means. If you have, let me go up here so I have some space. All right, let's draw over here. If you have a mountain, and we go up higher, and then here's the ocean, and then we go below. Now, I'm not below the ocean, but I'm below sea level. I'm like not in water over here. Let's just go to elevations lower than sea level. If I take my barometer at sea level, it's going to go up to 760 because there's a certain amount of pressure pushing down on the mercury and sending the mercury up to 760 millimeters. If I go up to a higher altitude, my barometer is not, or my mercury level is not going to go as high. It's going to be less than 760 millimeters because there's not as much pressure. I'm drawing little arrows here. There's not as much pressure pushing down as there is over here because there's fewer air mo molecules. This was a major picture we stressed during your PowerPoint. As you're down here at sea level, there's lots and lots of air pressure, lots of particles, but as you get up in altitude, there's fewer and fewer and fewer air molecules. So there's less, if you're way up here, there's less air particles pushing down on the barometer so the barometer doesn't uh, force mercury up as high. Whereas if you're down here below sea level, not only do you have all this air here at sea level, but you have even more now, because that column of air is even greater. So now, if you look at your mercury, you've got lots and lots and lots of air pushing down, lots of air pushing down, so it goes up really, really high, and you're gonna get values that are greater, oops, greater than 760, okay? Values that are greater than 760 millimeters of mercury if you're below sea level. Just remember this picture. As you go closer to the Earth, sea level, lots of particles. As you go higher, less particles. 
All right, what percent of air consists of oxygen? 21%, always, always, always. Percent does not change with altitude. What does change is a grand total number of particles. It's kind of like me saying to you, I'm gonna give you 21% of a dollar. That would be in higher altitudes. It's still 21%, but a dollar's not a whole lot of money. Versus close to the surface of the earth, where I say I'm gonna give you 21% of a million dollars. That's a lot more money. It's still 21%, but it's 21% of a greater grand total. So the grand total is changing as you go up altitudes. 35, intermolecular forces. IMF are attractive forces keeping particles together in a substance. Um, if substance X can be found as a solid liquid and a gas, which of these three states with the molecules that make up substance X have the strongest intermolecular forces? Solids have the strongest, and gases would obviously have the weakest. So particles and solids stay together, because they have the strongest attraction keeping them together. 36, evaporation. Why is it that some particles escape, but not all? Now, in order to evaporate, particles have to have a certain amount of kinetic energy. Only the particles at the surface of the liquid have enough kinetic energy to overcome the intermolecular forces keeping them together in the liquid state, and they're able to evaporate, not all of them. But then if you add more heat, more, can be uh, or can gain that energy, and more and more and more can evaporate over time. But it's only the ones that have enough energy will evaporate. Number 37 says, explain why your body feels cool when you sweat or step out of a pool or a shower. And then I mentioned that it has to do with evaporation, so elaborate. Now when a particle evaporates, it needs that energy we just talked about in order to evaporate. So it, where does it take the energy from? From your body. So if you have a little liquid molecule on your body, it wants to turn into a gas and escape. The only way it can do so is if it gains heat. So it's gonna pull heat out of your body. It's gonna take that energy, wiggle, 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 faster, faster, faster. Eventually it's gonna escape from the other particles that it's hanging out with as liquid. And then it's gonna turn into a gas and escape into the uh, atmosphere. Then more particles are left behind. They absorb more heat and they do the same thing. And that keeps happening over and over and over again until uh, the right amount of heat has been removed from your body or the water is no longer on the surface of your body. Describe what happens during the process of condensation. You've all seen condensation before when you take a shower and you look at the mirror, when you touch a glass or a soda or something um, that's out on a hot day. And basically, particles, gas particles, cool down, they lose their energy, and they get closer and closer together as they slow down and stop moving as fast. As they get closer, the intermolecular forces start getting stronger, and they cause that gas to become a liquid. The gas particles get closer, forces get stronger, pulls them together, keeps them together, and causes them to liquefy or condense. Water vapor, this is the second part, um, why do we end up with water on the outside of a cold glass? Water vapor near that cold object will collide with it and they'll lose the heat energy. The heat energy will go from the nice, hot, happy gas particles into that cold drink or cold glass, and then they'll lose their energy so they condense back into liquid water molecules.